you are looking at men on a hunt. The game they seek is not a living thing, and their weapons are not firearms. But they are hunting, and they are armed with the weapons of science. They are looking for oil. It won't be easy to find. As oil men say, it's that first barrel of oil that's hardest to get. That barrel number one. These hunters are well aware of that. They are geologists, trying to locate the position of oil deposits thousands of feet underground, which might be the hiding place of barrel number one. But the geologists do have one advantage. The game can't run from them. It will stay where it is until somebody finds it, if anyone ever does. There are many hunters in the field, other geologists working for other oil companies, all tracking down barrel number one. Their strategy is first to draw a picture of the rock formations where oil might be hidden. Many clues are used. Soil analysis, magnetic readings, and the shape of the Earth's surface. This is only the beginning of the picture, the first sketching. But if the sketch looks promising, it justifies a full-scale geophysical survey. The hunt is taken up by the seismograph crew. We're the seismograph crew. We're going to take a reading, a kind of picture of those underground formations the geologist sketched out in his report. The boys have dug shot holes along a line the surveyors laid out. They're placing charges so we can send some shock waves down into the earth and see how they react when they hit underground rock formations. We get our reading with these geophones. We call them jugs. We string them over the ground we want to survey, and they act as microphones. They'll pick up and record the vibrations of the blasting. Well, I guess we're about set. Hello, Charlie? Hello? What's loaded? 25 pounds, 65 top, 75 bottom. Okay, the offset? 50 feet. Direction of the jug? Northeast. Okay, time break. Time break. Okay. Tap the jug. Jug. Okay. Jug's good. Jug's good. Tap on the line. Tap on line. Tap is good. Good. You all ready? Ready. Shoot it. Shooting. One, two. The explosion shoots mud and water up in the air, while the sound vibrations travel downward to bounce off the underground formations. To our eyes, this doesn't look much like photography, but the end result is something like photography because we get a kind of picture. Sure, it's a confused scene to us, but those curves and wiggly lines have a lot of meaning to an expert. They tell the depth at which vibrations bounce back from various formations. And that brings us a step closer to a picture of the spot where barrel number one may be waiting. This is called a profile map, and it shows what you would see if you could cut out a piece of the earth like a slice of cake. Information from other tests in the area is incorporated in the map, and when completed, it represents months of work by dozens of skilled technicians. And then there's a question. 
The question is, do we have oil under here or don't we? I'm chief geologist for the company, and I can tell you I don't know. Nobody really knows. You may wonder why there's oil underground in the first place. One theory is that oil was formed from organic matter that fell to the bottom of the seas ages ago. Through millions of years of heat, pressure, bacterial action, crude petroleum was formed, thousands of feet under the earth. After still more millions of years under the earth's tremendous heat and pressure, plus thousands of natural upheavals, caused the oil to be caught in various types of underground rock formations. These formations are called oil traps. And we think there are oil traps under this land. That's our best judgment. But you don't ever know there's oil there until you drill down and get it, or get nothing. Now comes the time when we've got to stick our neck out. This is the time for the big decision. The production men make the decision. They know it's a big risk, for the odds are eight to one against finding oil in this type of an operation. Is it worth spending from $100,000 to perhaps over a million dollars to follow through on this try? They think it is. No one guarantees their investment. As a privately owned and managed company, they take the risk. They'll drill. Next, the landman enters the picture. He searches land office records, and when he has located rightful owners, begins negotiating for mineral rights on the property. A lease rental is paid to the landowner until production is achieved, if it is achieved. Then he receives a royalty, usually one-eighth of the value of the oil produced. The landman will breathe easier when the lease is set. After all, there's competition from other oil companies for that signature. Then new wheels are set in motion, starting the long process that will put a verdict on their judgment. Is it correct or incorrect? I wish just once they'd drill one of these things right smack by a nice, smooth highway. You know, when we were still hauling in the steel for this rig, we ran right into two weeks of solid rain. Just tried driving through that gum. They had to build a timber road so we could keep going. <laughs> you want to look for another job? Not me. I like this one. But I sure hope they don't drill a dry hole after all this. they could drill, they had to put up the derrick, high as a 10-story building. drill was ready to grind its way down through the rock. This job will wear out dozens of these bits, drilling down about a mile and a half, where we hope we'll strike oil. The rotary table drives the drill in the hole. A special blend of mud and chemicals is pumped down the hole to lubricate the drill and bring up the rock cuttings. If you're going to drill down a mile and a half, that means you need a mile and a half of drill pipe to turn the drill. 
The derrick is constructed to lower and raise this great length of heavy pipe. As the drill goes down, more and more sections of pipe are added to the upper end. The daily demand for oil in this country alone is nearly 8 million barrels. This has spurred competing companies to meet the demand and exceed it. For every barrel of oil pumped from the ground, one and one quarter more have been found. Finally, after five months of drilling, we are down to the formation that we hope will yield oil. Now the drill pipe and drill are removed for the last time. Below us is a long hole in the ground that passes through earth, sand, and rock. In order to prevent it from caving in, a metal casing is set in the hole as a lining. The lengths are hoisted and then lowered to the drilling floor. are screwed together. Then they are tightened with huge tongs. All the joints are welded for extra strength. Now the casing is set and they're ready to find out what they've got. They call me a driller. I'm boss of this gang. We're not sure what we've got here, you understand. Might get oil, might get suitcase rock. That's granite. Rarely is oil found in commercial quantities below granite, so when we hit it, we just pack up our suitcases and move on. In the old days, a gusher would shoot clear to the top of the rig and all over a couple of acres. It was pretty wasteful. We don't let it happen nowadays. Today, when the oil starts coming up, we keep it under control with a blowout valve and a Christmas tree. That's what we call that series of pipes and valves, a Christmas tree. We're down a mile and a half. That's as far as we figured to go, and we're acidizing now. The acid gets down in there and works on the rock at the bottom. If there's oil in that rock, release of pressure will shoot it up the whole mile and a half. Let's hope we've got something to cut off. We got it. This time we beat the odds. We got our barrel number one. Yes, they got it. Another barrel number one. Other crews and other oil companies also are finding a barrel number one, competing in a race throughout the country, night and day, the whole year round. Now all that you see of our oil well is the Christmas tree through which the oil is flowing up out of the ground and into the field tanks. Barrel number one is beginning to roll. It will be some time before our barrel really reaches the refinery, but she's on her way. My name's Wilson. 
I'm the assistant dispatcher here at the main pumping station. We've got your barrel number one over in that tank. Now, our job is to move the oil from the field tanks to the refinery. Now, of course, it's not a level run. So, our main pump here and two smaller ones like it boost the oil along. Matter of fact, here's a pumping order for the tank that includes your barrel. We're due to pump out of that tank at 11 o'clock tonight. Now, how do we keep track? My boss, the senior dispatcher, calls the signals on how much we ship to the refinery and when. He uses a chart to control the whole system. It's a sort of a timetable for the entire operation. The big board works day and night and the pipes carrying the oil from those widely scattered field tanks to the gathering tank farms and then into the trunk line are seldom empty. And all trunk lines eventually verge on the same location, the refinery or other terminal. we've got your barrel number one here now and we'll go to work on her. Our job is to make useful products out of the crude oil. Let's take a little walk around and I'll show you how we do it. Right now, barrel number one, along with thousands of other barrels, is down in one of the storage tanks, waiting to be processed. Crude oil, you see, doesn't have much use in its raw, natural state. We start the operation by sending the oil through this giant furnace where most of it is vaporized. The hot vapors and remaining liquids go into this tower and are broken down into the component parts or fractions. That's why we call it a fractionating tower. It's not easy to visualize what goes on inside there. So let's drop in at the laboratory and take a look at this model. We have the furnace here. The crude boils off enters the tower, and the vapors rise toward the top. At the very top, we draw off the vapors that condense into gasoline. Next, we draw off the fraction that gives us kerosene. Further down, at a higher temperature, we get the fuel oils and diesel fuel. Lubricating oil comes off down here, and at the very bottom, asphalt. The tower is really a giant still, and our work is essentially distillation. There are other methods of refining, such as cracking. This is called a catalytic cracker. It uses a chemical substance, which brings about a change in the molecules of petroleum. But the objective is still the same, to break the oil into more useful fractions. We've been talking a lot about fractions, so let's take a look at them. Bill, this is more on your line. Suppose you tell us something about the fractions we cut from the crude. Take our barrel number one as an example. Why, I can show you a picture of it. There are 42 gallons of crude in your barrel. On the average, we cut the fractions from crude oil. This shows the difference between today's yield and 1918. We've nearly doubled the gasoline, for instance. Uh, I think these two drawings tell a whole lot about the accomplishments of research, Bill. They tell the story of competition, too. When we improve, our competitors improve. So we have to improve again. And the customers benefit all around. These are samples of some of the typical products. Gasoline, kerosene, fuel oil, lubricating oil, and so on. Dozens of products. Scores of them. Research brought them into being, and research goes on improving its work. Most of those projects, of course, are carried on in the main research center. Yes, we've got quite a few projects going here at the main research center. Lubricating oil is just one example. Miss Conway is working on a turbine oil, for instance. I might say now there are plenty of opportunities for young women as well as young men in petroleum research. Our work looks into the future. For example, petroleum research has turned up the raw materials for over 2,500 different chemicals. 
We're after new products and new uses for old ones. Synthetic rubber, for instance. One of its principal components is butadiene, which comes from petroleum. Or take the case of automobile engines. The laboratory works with engine designers and road test personnel to know what they're planning and to develop the right fuels and lubricants. We're working on jet fuels all the time, constantly improving. We're in touch with the market and we develop the answers to specific needs. It's not hit or miss, it's planned. No, research doesn't work blindly. It's not hit or miss. It paves the way for progress. Imagine that Lindbergh flew the Atlantic on gasoline that would hardly get our planes off the ground today. Today's skies demonstrate that research fills needs, anticipates needs. And in the future of research, there is no limit. But research also concerns itself with smaller, more close-to-home problems. And don't forget the housewives. Petroleum chemicals have helped us, too. They help with detergents, plastics, insecticides, synthetic fibers, and other things. Our barrel number one may travel by many types of transportation before it reaches its destination. By a modern oil tanker, for instance. Welcome aboard. Yes, we're taking on part of your number one barrel right now. Along with 140,000 other barrels. That's our capacity, 140,000 barrels. At that, we're not the largest tanker afloat. Some carry over 300,000 barrels. Open up number four center. We'll be underway to Seattle this evening. And we can carry a gallon of oil for less than it costs you to send a postcard. Yes, from Los Angeles to Seattle for the cost of a postcard per gallon. All types of barges and trains are used to bring our barrel number one to its final destination, the consumer. Competition requires the use of the most efficient means of transportation. In the oil industry, wholesale distribution is made primarily to bulk plants like this one. Wholesalers like jobbers and distributors buy large quantities of oil products and deliver them to retail dealers or other customers such as transportation companies, public utilities, factories, and service stations. At this point, barrel number one is in the hands of the retail dealer and ready for the use of the consumer. Some part of your barrel number one may be in this gasoline or in this port of oil. About 200,000 service stations are running today, offering a variety of products and service. About 95% of these stations are either privately owned or operated. Another distributor is the fuel oil dealer who may deliver a part of our barrel to a private home for use in heating. A part of our barrel number one may have found its way into liquefied petroleum gas delivered to this farm in pressurized metal cylinders for cooking. The farmer uses oil products to run his tractor, to heat his home, and for hundreds of other purposes. It's a long, long way. And many hands have touched our barrel number one since it made its first appearance when the well came in, when we beat the odds of eight to one. And at that time, it was already six years to the day when the search first started, when the geologists made their survey and began drawing a picture of the place where barrel number one was hidden. The number of people who helped in the job are too numerous to mention by name, and you've seen only a few of them. As a matter of fact, the industry uses the skills of about 2,000 job classifications. Of course, none of it would be any use without the dealers, who every day sell 84 million gallons of gasoline alone. Gasoline, the biggest seller of the industry, though far improved over what it was a quarter century ago, is still one of the biggest bargains on your shopping list. Another example of how oil serves you. The reason for it is pretty clear. Competitive enterprise. The spirit that motivates our thousands of independent oil companies. The spirit of incentive that built the industry in the best interests of the nation. In another part of the country, men continue the never-ending hunt. 
The game they seek is not a living thing, and their weapons are not firearms. But they are hunting, and they are armed with the weapons of science. If you don't mind my asking, just what do you expect to find out here? Another barrel number one. <laughs>